We have a lot of ground to cover with a deep dive into the world of Notoria type dendrobiums, of which I have three primary hybrids. If we were to see them in their natural habitat, we really would have a lot of ground to cover. We would be within the part of the world that covers the Philippines, Australia, Papua New Guinea, and many of the surrounding islands in that part of the world. We would also have our hiking boots on, any kind of mosquito repellent, and a lot of water because the conditions there are nothing short of amazing for orchids to thrive, but a little challenging for us to traverse, seeing as we would find ourselves in tropical rainforests at lower elevations within a hilly or mountainous terrain, possibly with some blisters after our hike is over. But anyway, these conditions are a few of the clues as to the care requirements these orchids have. So thank you for being here. Let's get to it. A lot of you have left some great questions and expressed interest in what it is about these orchids you're most interested in. Thank you for your response to the community post. The information provided will hopefully give you the best insight as to this fabulous group of dendrobiums, which will then result in fabulous growing and amazing blooms. While I'm repotting my orchid, I would like to draw your attention first of all to how you can pretty much identify a Latoria type dendrobium among other dendrobiums on the market. They come with interesting pseudobulbs. Some are a little bit more bulbous and some are a little bit more elongated, but mostly you will find that the mature growth of these dendrobiums will have a very slender base. And like a balloon that has as yet to be blown up fully, the pseudobulb changes shape along the upper area at which point leaves top of the growth. This is such an interesting attribute about these dens that even when not in bloom, their structures are such fun to look at because different. The look of the leaves of these dens vary. Some are darker green and feel as though they are dried leather, whereas others are lighter green. These do not mature as stiff as the darker green ones, but once they have matured, they are not as flexible as they look either. Most dendrobiums have leaves that are much more flexible, but Latoria dens do not. A blooming Latoria dendrobium will also catch your eye because the blooms are something to behold. If you are into the funky, twisted, curling, tentacle, look, you will find that dominates any Latoria type dendrobium. But if you're not into that kind of a look, then there are other types that are much more delicate looking, more elegant and softer, less aggressive to the eye. Either way, the blooms of Latoria dens appear to have a downward habit of opening and are best looked at from below. While the backside of the blooms are just as interesting because of all the spotting and markings coming through the petals and sepals to appreciate the intricacies of the bloom from the front, they really are are best appreciated when looking at them from below. If you're not sure what you're looking at in case you see the pseudobulbs catch your eye but the orchid is still only in bud and you have not been able to check if the blooms could match that of a Latoria dendrobium, then another characteristic that many of these dens have is that the buds are gnarly. They have protrusions, almost wart-like with little hairs added but they're not hairs. They have spiky looking things along the peduncle but they are not spiny. There's just a lot going on which is what makes these so interesting to watch mature and open up. So if you're attracted to something that looks odd but funky and has interest whether in bloom or not, then honestly look no further than Latoria dendrobiums. You also don't have to go all the way to Papua New Guinea. <laughs> they are not that difficult to find because of their somewhat climate condition tolerance with some tweaks here and there depending on the conditions and environment you're growing them in because of humidity or lack thereof. Which brings me to the subject of water requirements. The highest elevation where these can be found up to but not often encounters would be 3,800 meters but they are mainly found in the rainforest terrain which provides them with year-round rainfall. Ergo these dendrobiums love their water. The humidity rarely falls below 80 percent so with plenty of rainfall and then when it doesn't rain they are surrounded by constant water from within the air these orchids should never be allowed to dry out even during what we consider winter months even when the orchid is not in active growth but is coming into bloom. There is no amount of too much water that these dens can't handle unless you have temperatures that drop below 15 degrees Celsius. 
then it will depend on how quickly or slowly the media starts to dry out. However, even if the media takes a little longer to dry out, it must never dry out completely, even during cooler conditions. I will cover low temperature issues, but let me just say that I cannot emphasize just how important it is to have your Latoria dens have consistent access to water, even if you are blessed with consistent high humidity. Here's the general condition requirements card for Latoria dens dendrobiums that I included in a video about the most popular section of dendrobiums. I thought it might be of help for you to see the preferences at a single glance. Also, because I am able to show you the temperature high that is preferred and favorable for these orchids, no matter the size, because Latoria dens include miniatures like Dendrobium polysema, all the way up to the largest growth structures which would include the Dendrobium spectabile. If your temperatures dip below the preference of the orchid, you will see leaves curl, as is the case here with my Nafritz Alex Poli and also my Roy Tokonaga. The situation is much worse for my Roy Tokonaga because the parents of this orchid are low altitude and high temperature orchids. On one hand, you have the Ultraviolacea, which falls under the category of intermediate to warm, but prefers warm. And on the other hand, you have the Johnsonier, which also is intermediate to warm, so there is little to no grace of low temperature tolerance with the Roy Tokonaga, as opposed to the Nafritz Alex Poli that has the cool to intermediate parent, which is Dendrobium polysema. Having this parent in the hybrid makes it possible for the Nafritz Alex Poli to be more temperature tolerant when it comes to cooler conditions. So while Latorias can be grown intermediate to warm across the board, it is important to note which parents go into a hybrid so as to gauge what tolerance levels they have in cooler conditions. As an example, I can grow my lutein's blanc outdoors all year round here in southern Spain. And while the occasional low of 5 degrees Celsius is not exactly the cool that this hybrid would prefer, for, for a long period of time, it is coping really well because one of the parents of this orchid is the polysema. So if you have cooler conditions that your Latoria has to contend with for a certain period of time, consider the choice of media. The choice of media as mentioned should be such that you can water frequently without letting it dry out and also without you having to water every day. But I would advise against using LECA when it comes to cooler temperature conditions because LECA has the characteristic of of evaporative cooling, which lowers the temperature in the pot even further compared to anything the ambient temperature may be. If you would like to use inorganic media, then use lava rock because that does not come with evaporative cooling. And in my dry climate, I have lutein's blanc in a setup of medium-sized lava rock and semi-hydro. It has worked so well all these years, and since I got my lutein's blanc as a little seedling, I never had any issues with lava rock and semi-hydro. But I'm sticking to LECA with my Nafritz Alex Poli because for the majority of a 12-month calendar year, the conditions of this orchid in my climate are too harsh, seeing as I only average 30% humidity. I would not be able to keep up with the watering needs of this orchid if I went with lava rock. And especially as I am bumping up the pot size for this orchid and lava rock only has so much capacity in self-watering or semi hydro when it comes to pot size. Eventually a large pot will not serve its purpose for semi-hydroponic growing when using lava rock. But if you're growing your Latoria in organic media then I highly recommend you use medium-sized bark or if your orchid is not as established yet use seedling bark and always add sphagnum moss or another water retentive media like rock wool or even pumice into the mix. This way you will not be chasing the orchid on the daily to keep it happy and hydrated. And also please always consider the comments section for any questions specific to your location to the size of your orchid which one are you dealing with there are after all approximately 53 species of Latorias and many many hybrids and if you are wanting a confirmation to a possible gut feeling you have ask away please bring that to my attention in the comments also while I'm at it I would so appreciate it if you would be so kind as to give this video a thumbs up even share it on other social media platforms and well if you have not subscribed to the channel, take a moment and help us out here. Please subscribe. Support like this is so appreciated. Thank you. Now there's something I would like to draw your attention to, muy importante, when it comes to Latoria dens, and that is their root system, their growth habit, and what you can expect. 
Seeing as I have three primary hybrids in my collection, I can only speak on these three, but as they have parents, I think that the combination and variety of the different Latorias that I do have in my collection, even if they're just represented as parents, has given me great insight into the root activity. Most importantly, here's what you need to look out for when it comes to the Roy Tokunaga. The root system of this orchid is as fragile as glass is, and it won't recover when damaged. You can see that my Roy is struggling because the roots in the pot are not happy, and that is because of the lecker, the cooler temperatures as mentioned previously. So this orchid is struggling in general. When it comes time to repot her, I will just place her in self-watering again, but this time with lava rock, as the pot size will remain the same. However, I'm not touching this orchid until I see new root growth. When it comes to Latoria dens and not just Roy Tokunaga, know that you have to wait for new root growth before repotting so as not to have your Latoria dens stall or start to decline, no matter what time of year it is. If your conditions are conducive to the preferences of your dendrobium, then only repot when you see new roots and they usually start to appear when the new growth has leafed out and is not quite mature yet. It may even take as long as the new growth being fully mature, but repotting Latorius just at the point that the new growth is emerging at the base is too soon and then the orchid is going to have a hard time growing that new growth. The good news though is all Latoria dendrobiums are happy root growers, so we are not dealing with orchids that are stingy on the root front, which is a relief. But from the three that I have in my collection, the Roy Tokonaga has the most fragile root system out of all three, and well, let me just expand that and say out of my entire collection, I have never seen orchid roots just snap even with the gentlest handling. When you repot a Roy Tokunaga, know that it is not you being clumsy and that is why the roots are breaking. It is the characteristics of the roots and there is no way around it. But the other Latorias that I have, those roots are tough as nails, thank goodness. At least the delicate root system that comes with the Roy Tokonaga is not representative of the root system of the entire Latoria dendrobium section. For the most part, if we do damage during a repot with those other orchids, it is not such a detriment to those orchids and thankfully those roots will branch and not fail if they are damaged and that includes the viable existing older roots. So let me know if you have any questions about the roots, if you're growing Latorias and which ones you are growing, if you would like a little bit more detail on what you may be dealing with or can expect when it comes time to repotting your specific Latoria. And when it comes to light requirements, please no direct sun. However, if you are in hemispheres with a distinct winter season and the sun weakens during that time period, then direct morning or afternoon sun is feasible if you're not supplementing with artificial light. But know that the leaves of your Latoria dendrobium will tell you the light level that they can handle. The darker leaves will be able to tolerate more sun than the lighter leafed Latorias. It sounds reversed from what we know about nobly orchids, but it is the case. As you can see with my Roy Tokonaga that has the anthocyanin blush much more pronounced than my Nafert's Alex Poli, and both of them are pretty much living in the same place and get moved at the same time when the sun hits that staging area. So bright shade all year round is perfect across the board for all Latoria dendrobiums and that will ensure the orchids will bloom if they are of a mature size. You do not need to have an anthocyanin blush on your leaves to know that you are giving your orchid enough light. Preferably no anthocyanin should appear because you don't want to burn the leaves which can happen quickly with the light green leaves. But what you can expect from a blooming size Latoria is a long lasting floriferous bloom show and in many cases fragrant blooms with a time frame of easily three months if not more. On most Latorias you should expect to see spikes forming at the apex of the leaves around mid-fall. However be patient, <laughs> these orchids take forever to develop their spikes and then forever to push buds but then it appears that they are in bloom forever as well. So mid-fall, check the apex of your leaves and see if you can spot spikes. And don't forget to check the areas of the leaf joints that have already spiked previously because these orchids will grow spikes even in areas where they have already had bloomed from. That is why they are so quickly to becoming blooming spectacles. And in the right conditions, it is said that they bloom more than once a year, but that is not something I can vouch for. 
mine bloom from midwinter into early spring. And if you're in a climate that doesn't really have a harsh winter season, a telltale winter season, the months that that defines is December all the way through to early April. If you happen to live in the Northern Hemisphere, and should you be growing in the Southern Hemisphere, expect these things to start happening during the months of June, July, and August. If I got the equivalent months wrong on these two, please let me know in the comments, clear that up for myself, as well as for anybody reading the comments section for more information. Thank you for that, I appreciate it. Anyway, I choose to snip off spikes so that they can start to switch from blooming and metabolize hormones to get into active growth much quicker because the longer the orchid is in bloom, the longer it may take to get new growths to start. If you're dealing with the temperature fluctuations as per weather conditions and don't have the benefit of a controlled environment. That is a personal choice of mine to cut the bloom period short because I need the new growths to grow during a time of year when the temperatures are perfect for my Latorius. So if you're wondering what I do with my Roy Tokonaga being the fussiest of the three, well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I do not let her bloom for long at all because Madam grows new growth during the cooler months of the year. Well, that is too stressful for this orchid in my conditions. Within two weeks of enjoying the blooms, I choose to cut them off. However, there is no need to do that if you have the right conditions and a healthy root system. Enjoy the blooms of a Roy Tokonaga, which again could last at least three months, if not more. So throughout this repot, you may have noticed spotting on my leaves and other weird apparitions, and that is what I want to discuss briefly. I have found that my Nafritz Alex Boli and Roy Tokonaga are prone to thrips. That is the damage you see, and the spotting on the underside of the leaves is when I treated them with garlic alcohol at a time of day when it was too warm. So in order for me to keep thrips off my orchids, I use garlic alcohol, but have now conditioned myself to treat these orchids early evening so as not to affect the stomata. The worst thrip damage I had was to a pseudobulb where they went mental between the bracts or sheaths of the new growths while the sheath was not mature yet and I did not see what was going on until the leaves started to show signs of stress. So upon removal of the sheaths, I found a whole colony of thrips having a field trip. Let me tell you that was an experience and it was a one-off. I try to be super vigilant now in the hopes that there is no repeat of that nonsense. But because of the time of year these orchids bloom, aphids are also hard pressed to find anything in mother nature, so be on the lookout for aphids as spikes grow and buds form. The gnarly features the spikes and buds as well as blooms have on some Latorius make it very difficult to remove the aphids and I have sometimes resorted to a dry paintbrush to get them off with limited success, but it's better to be on top of them as opposed to aphids destroying the blooms. These are the only two pests that I have noticed on Latorias over the years. However, again, if you have other pests that you have noticed on yours, it would be great to give us a heads up on those. Can't be complacent about orchids and pests, especially depending on which part of the world we grow in. Now, as a final care tip, I fertilize and supplement these orchids with a well-balanced fertilizer throughout the year because they do not go into winter rest. There's always something going on with these orchids, whether they're growing new growths followed by roots and then the spikes and all the months that they are in bloom, these orchids are busy and always need something to draw from in order to keep up their energy levels for all this gorgeous blooming that goes on. But I'm really focusing on supplementing with calcium nitrate and CalMAT during the cooler months of the year, as well as when I see new growth starting. These two supplements are my focus for the first month of seeing new growths, and then the orchid fertilizer kicks in. If you would like to have the amounts that I use for each orchid depending on size, also let me know in the comments. I just wanted to emphasize that with the focus on calcium, it is my hope that the leaf structures will be stronger and more resilient to my thrift issue. Now I have only done that since the growing season of 2023 and I'm not sure it has proven to be 100% successful because I can see thrips damage on the new growths. However, they are not as pronounced. So it could be that I am starting to win because of when I treat against the pests or because of the focus on the calcium or maybe both. 
Anyway, time will tell, and I hope that you will be around for that as these orchids continue to grow and bloom for us. And I hope that you will be around also when I do get to repotting the Roy Tokonaga, because that is going to prove super interesting. I have questions, but until I get into the pot, they won't be answered 100%. <laughs> I have my suspicions, but, you know, we have to see what's going on in the pot in order to get our answer, and then proceed to solve the issues based on what we see in the pot. I want to thank you so much for the questions from everyone that responded to my community post. I hope that I answered every single question with this video and you know the drill. A video like this can prompt further questions, so bring them on and let's continue the conversation in the comments. In the meantime, I also want to thank you for watching, especially thank you for watching to the end. This gives me the opportunity to wish you a wonderful day, on the condition though please, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.